Okay. How's it going? My name is Steven Christian. I am the owner and creator of Viltopia Studios, and I'm also a medical student and an MD PhD student at the University of Nevada, Reno. And this is just an introduction of myself and my journey and how I kind of just got started. How did I get started? So I was playing football at the University of Hawaii. And during that time, I had two hip surgeries. So I had hip reconstructive surgery by the time I was 21. And during that time, I was playing NCAA football. I wasn't sure if I was going to make it to back to the field or not. And so I had this idea of wanting to get into comics and specifically get into animation because I was a big animation fan. Growing up, just Kids WB, Fox Kids, Toonomini, everything that I enjoyed about entertainment was always related to animation. And so I was a big fan of the boondocks and one of my cousins really got me into the boondocks by via the comic strip. And so I ended up collecting all the comic strips. And when the show came out, that was by far my favorite show. It was one of those things that inspired me to be creative and use my mind and my witty nature and just using comedy and satire to uh, tell stories and build connections with people. And the boondocks really resonated with me mainly because I didn't really see any other cartoons that really pushed the envelope that had mainstream appeal very much like the boondocks. And so for me, my goal was to recreate the boondocks in my own image. And during this time, the boondocks was off the air for years and I didn't know when it was going to be coming back. We don't count season four uh, because it wasn't associated with the uh, main creator, but you know, seasons one, two, and three, those really resonated with me. And so I ended up going to Borders Books uh, around the time that I had my second surgery, going to Borders Books. And around that time as well, I was doing summer school. And I ended up taking a writing for comics class or a history of comics class. And it was a writing intensive. And so I had to take a writing intensive during my last summer at the University of Hawaii. And during that time, it exposed me to the history of comics, what comics were used for. And not only that, but it allowed me to really explore the applications of comics and the expressive nature of comics. And mind you, like I was taking this as a writing intensive. So it was a lot of writing, a lot of reading. And I think it really set me up for being able to explore a lot of different things through the medium because I had to take it seriously for my grade, but I also had to find a feasible outlet. And so the combination of me taking this history of comics class, as well as being interested in the boondocks by via the comic strip in the cartoon, this set me on a path that very much paved the way for the next 10 years of my life. And so I ended up going to Borders Books, getting a web comics for teens book, and I ended up doing a extra credit assignment for my class where we had to create our own comic for extra credit. And so that was by far the first time I ever made a comic. And then once I started to look up a lot of the different processes of how to make comics, so I ended up thinking like, huh, if I want to make comics and cartoons just like Aaron Magruder with the Boondocks, what better way than to just look it up? And so I quite literally just Google searched how Aaron Magruder got the Boondocks off the ground. And he quite literally just started off with making a comic, doing it for the school newspaper. And he ended up getting syndicated. And then after years of working and grinding and telling stories and getting published, then he garnered enough attention to actually get it on the, you know, pitch an episode or pitch a pilot. And then he ended up getting a show greenlit. And so I was like, I'm going to just do that. Like, why not? Because all you got to do is just like create stuff, put it out there. If people like it, then they will continue to support it. And that was my mind. That was my thought process going in. Right. And so it just so happened that once the fall came and the spring came uh, after I finished with surgery, after I started to figure out how to make comics and stuff, I ended up seeing an ad for the school newspaper saying that they needed cartoonists. And so the paper was getting published like three times a week. It's so I was like, boom, you know, I could get paid for every comic that I publish and 
this will allow me to build up a big um, catalog so that I could pitch it and get syndicated and then ultimately get my cartoon, just like Aaron Magruder. And so that's essentially what I did, right? And so I ended up getting published three to four times a week. And then from there, I had a catalog and I started to pitch it off to different newspaper syndications and everything after I got a good amount of months in me. And that allowed me to really build my stamina and get used to creating in a way that was beneficial for me as an emerging creator. Because as a football player, I needed to figure out a way to channel the stuff that I channeled this energy, this raw energy that I had uh, because football really wasn't there. And so by me quite literally just taking the approach that I would normally do for football, where I'm working out every day, I'm training, I'm investing into my body and my craft uh, in hopes of being able to utilize that during the games and the season and in practice, I just applied that same approach to my creative practice. And so as I would study, I would study different artists. I would, you know, watch MSNBC and try to be better as a writer and understand the history and the satire and how that worked. And then I started to develop my style so that I could be more efficient with creating. And also when people see my work, they know that it's coming from me and it's an extension of me as an artist and a creator. And mind you, I was going through my second hip reconstructive surgery, right? And so I really needed a way to take my mind off of the fact that I got to college through football and I wasn't able to play football anymore. And so that really, it resonated with me in this interesting way that like I didn't feel comfortable with, mainly because I didn't have any tools to navigate the isolation and navigate the politics of football when you're injured. And quite literally, my whole... My whole world was wrapped around me being an athlete in my body. And so I found that it was really difficult to take these life skills that I developed, right? Where it's determination, resilience, adaptability, and translate that. But I had time and I had a, a narrow focus of what I wanted to do. I wanted to make a cartoon. And so being able to fill up my time that would normally take, be taken with football and being able to just channel that directly into something and see the outcome, you know, every other day, really get published, boom, go to the newsstand. And then I was able to enjoy and share with my friends and all that. It was it was a good avenue. And I was able to do that and take advantage of it while I was injured. And so then I ended up, you know, because uh, one of the things I sort of pride myself on is kind of being hard headed and going against the grain a lot. And so I ended up recovering from playing football. Uh, I ended up recovering from my hip surgeries and I ended up graduating from the University, of, the University of Hawaii and I ended up going to Oregon State for a master's program and also finishing up my last two years of college football. During that time, I also, because I had a catalog from the paper at Hawaii, I was able to easily jump in and be a cartoonist for the Oregon State barometer at Oregon State. And so it was one of those things where I got to fine tune my craft every week. And as I was playing, I was, you know, playing games and then I would make comics on the side and I would get those in, you know, quite literally off the jump. And so it was a really good way for me to really make that transition point to go back into football, but also fine tune my craft. And I was able to do that for the next two years, which is great because I ended up building up a bigger catalog. And being able to work with different entities and publishers was really was really a testament to my dedication, my resilience, to where I was able to manage my time and I was able to go to practice. I was able to be in a master's program and do all that stuff. And then not only, I was getting published every week. And, and sometimes it would be really interesting because I would make comics that were kind of edgy sometimes. And so I remember I would go to like training table and the coaches and the administration, they would be reading the paper and then they would see my comic and they'd be like, hey, Steve, you know, this joke that you made. What did you mean by that? And they would isolate these different jokes and stuff like that. And um, whether it's talking about, you know, social issues, political issues, uh, references to substance abuse and all that stuff. Um, I tried to make I always try to write stuff in a way that. Uh, 
uh, approaches it from a, a child's perspective. So it forces you to think and it kind of goes over your head sometimes because you're looking at it through the perspective of kids and how they personalize and rationalize all these things. And so when I would touch that envelope, you know, I would always get a little bit of a talking to, but at the end of the day, you know, it's something that you grow to enjoy and you grow and you learn from and you learn how to, you know, teeter that, that line very, you know, very succinctly over time. It doesn't, it falls short a lot, uh, but as you continue to go, it gets better and better. And that's one of the things that I've greatly appreciated from being able to create the stuff that I do. And mainly because, you know, it's expression. And I know what it's like to not be able to do the things that I enjoy and having to channel everything into uh, creative outlets so that, you know, you don't become an alcoholic and, and you don't let stress get the best of you and you, you're able to get sleep and, and, you know, you don't succumb to anxieties and stuff like that. And so throughout that process, it was very formative because uh, it was one of those, it was probably one of the first times that I was in a program uh, by virtue of uh, going to Oregon State, getting into a master's program and uh, exploring a master's program through an interdisciplinary lens, right? So I was studying fine arts. I was studying exercise sports science or, you know, uh, kinesiology. And then I was studying uh, psychology. And so I, one of my uh, advisors, she was just like, hey, Steve, like, you know, you're, you're doing, you're playing football. You you have these life experiences that you're doing on a regular basis. And they're really informing how you're approaching things. And you have this thing on the side in this program where you're fine tuning a craft in, in, on an academic level. And why don't you find ways to combine the two? Why, instead of doing stuff on the side, incorporate that into your work. And I really appreciate her, uh, Dr. Trisha Goodnow. Uh, who's been one of my biggest supporters uh, since I got to the program, really, uh, and, you know, beyond the program, because she was the first person to really just tell me, and, and that's honestly what I needed, is just somebody just tell me, like, hey, you could just do this. Just do it, because why not? And so I remember just sitting down with her, and she was like, hey, you're already writing comics for the paper. You had this idea of doing a graphic novel. You are studying art. You are an athlete, you have all these interests and you have a way through the interdisciplinary program to really like combine those and, and really excel your voice in a, in a particular way that the program will support. And she was just like, just make a graphic novel. Like you're already thinking about it. Why don't you just do it? And I was just like, I could <laughs> like, really, I thought I had to like do something different. And she was like, nah, like, just make a graphic novel and, you know, use research and your classes to support the stuff that you put in the novel and, you know, have your art classes and stuff inform the style that you want to approach it with. But just do it, like do it and then see how it turns out. And so, you know, I think in many ways, like because coming from football, you are it becomes really like as an athlete you for the most part you the culture is really built around you showing up putting forth the best effort doing your job and then leaving it all out on the field right and so when you go into it you find yourself by virtue of the role that you ascribe to right so i was a cornerback i was a i, I, I was first a uh quarterback and then once i got recruited to be a defensive back then i moved over to the defensive side and I started to embody the role of a defensive back and the things that tailored to it. So it informed how I trained. It informed how I worked out. It informed how I learned plays, how I navigated football. Because going from the offensive side and the defensive side, it that's just that's just how it works, right? And so, you know, in many ways, like you're you're set up for success by coaches putting you in the right position so that you can do well. And I felt like that structure really helped me navigating, you know, my life as a student athlete and to see a avenue, see something that was very familiar to me in that way where, you know, she helped me. She helped set me up for success in a way that was very specific to me. And it's something that I really appreciated. And it's something that I needed. 
because very often student athletes, for better or for worse, you take them off the field and they don't know what to do because they don't have the direction. They don't have the guidance. Put them on the field. They know everything to do. They could be Hall of Famers and everything because they have the capacity to do that. And but when you take them off the field, it really, you know, there, it's, there's no direction for them to go. And I fell victim to that, too. And one of the things that really helped was, you know, by virtue of me exploring those intersections, I ended up making a graphic novel called No Love for Gladiators. And it really explored the intersections of my plight as a student athlete and trying to, you know, explore art and academics and athletics all at the best, you know, to the best of my ability and finding problems with that and ultimately coming up with the conclusion that the NCAA, for better or for worse, the NCAA, uh, because of how everything is structured, it doesn't set people up for success off the field, despite them having success on the field. And so you could be a Hall of Famer and still not pass your classes. And even if you get a degree, like you don't know how to apply anything. And for better or for worse, they'll fall into a, a problem that I did where I had a master's degree and I go into the workforce after having a very good athletic experience in college. I was successful both on the field and off the field and I was unhirable. And, and so I ended up making that as a graphic novel. And that's a story that I want to like continue telling and be able to revisit as I uh, wrap up Island Fever. But for the most part, I, that was the only opportunities that were afforded to me after I finished playing. And so after I finished playing, I ended up uh, putting it on Kickstarter, uh, publishing the first graphic novel as a independent publisher and getting picked up to work on a documentary uh, from a bunch of guys coming out of USC and stuff uh, called uh, The Business of Amateurs. And that was probably my, I mean, that was my first job. Like that was my first job where I got to animate. I got to meet great people that are working on student athlete rights and really be able to take those concepts that I was exploring in my graphic novel and in my master's thesis and really be able to see those on the big screen. And quite literally, like I, the movie theater that I would go to um, in Emeryville, I was able to actually have a screening there, have a screening at uh, Oregon State, have a screening at Portland State when I moved up to Portland. And it was a, it was a great experience because I, it was full circle for me where I got to be a student athlete. I got to play. I didn't make it to the NFL. You know, I had injuries and all that stuff. Uh, but I was able to take the stuff that I learned and express myself through that and really have a good sort of send off of that experience. Albeit it, you know, it was, it was still difficult, but to be able to explore many of the experiences that I had with it, it was really great. And so afterwards I ended up, uh, sleeping on my sister's couch in LA and trying to figure out how to like make all this stuff work. Right. And so ended up going to Portland. Portland was probably one of the best decisions that I ever made, mainly because it allowed me to really, really create um, experiences that uh, resonated with me on an artistic level and really find my voice. And so everything that I'm doing now with Iltopia really stemmed from that experience of working as a, just an independent artist, just trying to make pay bills and, and figure out that whole route. And so when I got to Oregon, uh, when I got to Portland, uh, you know, I ended up doing a Kickstarter. I was at Portland state. I did a Kickstarter for uh, the first volume of violent fever and ended up getting that kickstarted. And that became the first book in the series, uh, which ended up being season three, but like, that's just the first book in the series for, uh, for Island fever. And again, I was still writing for the newspaper and I was doing a whole bunch of stuff for that. Right. And so afterwards I, I, you know, started to get more into animation. Um, I made Pokemon Torque team. I made a whole bunch of different, uh, things that really allowed me to really leave my stamp on the animation space on the internet. And it allowed me to get a couple of projects, but I really wanted to find a way to combine the work that I was doing as an animator and combine that with my work as a comic artist, because for better or for worse, I would tell people at conventions or in passing that I'm an animator, but with, you know, the lack of internet in convention centers and just the inaccessibility of animation outside of, you know, the big screen or the small screen or whatever you, it just wasn't, that wasn't a thing that you could really do. Um, 
animation wasn't as accessible and there wasn't really a market to get paid because you would have to charge more and all that stuff. And so I, you know, got introduced to augmented reality uh, by virtue of watching out of all places, a black breakfast club interview with Charlemagne the God and will I am was on is showing his masters of the sun graphic novel. And at the end of the interview, he showed that you could use your phone to bring something to life and, and, and show animation and stuff. And so that introduced me to literally the, the pathway. And so afterwards, um, ended up getting the book, uh, checked it out and it was really cool. And then I ended up going to Adobe Max uh, in 2019. And in Adobe Max, that's when they introduced Adobe Arrow. And Adobe Arrow was the augmented reality solution that they had, that they were launching and they were releasing for that. And so I ended up getting to see people that quite literally were making comics, and adding animation and 3D models to those comics and really bringing them to life. And I was like, that is exactly what I'm trying to do. Exactly what I'm trying to do. Why? Because I have always wanted to find a way to just combine technology and art and be able to express myself and not make compromises. And so one of the things that I started to do was, you know, I ended up get by that time I was uh, making my own books. And I remember going down the expo floor and stumbling upon the paper maker at Adobe Max that I used off of Amazon to like buy paper to make my stuff. And I just so happened to meet one of the project managers and she actually had an augmented reality graphic novel or children's book that she made with the paper. And I was just like, dude, like this is exactly what I'm trying to do. So I got to talk to them. They gave me some resources, introduced me to Unity and the rest was history. I ended up getting like five different courses from uh, Udemy. And I that's what I started to learn at the end of 2019. Fast forward to 2020, you know, I was still trying to get into medical school. I was still trying to do all those things. It didn't really work out. I got rejected by like 70, 80 schools. I got rejected on all my interviews and stuff. And so I was kind of, you know, I was stuck. It was interesting how I got introduced to the actual applications of comics in augmented reality and with Unity, really. And so I was walking down the expo floor at Adobe Max and at this time I was making books by hand. And so I wasn't making a lot of sales, but so I, I was able to support it and it was a lot cheaper. And I really treated the bookmaking process as an extension of my creative process where I could control the paper stocks. If there was a, I had a fake newspaper inside the book. And so I would use newsprint. And then for uh, comic strips that were black and white, I would use a cheaper paper. If I needed to have any uh, color pages, then I could add color pages and I had full control over the book making experience that I would give to people. And so I remember walking down the expo floor at Adobe Max and I ended up seeing a booth for the paper maker that I used. And at this point I was like, okay, this is a paper maker that I just get off of Amazon. I didn't realize they were like an actual company, right? And so I remember seeing them, I was like, hey, I use your paper. It's great to see you. Apparently they're a huge company. And so I was just like, oh, you know, news to me. And so I ended up talking to them and then they're like, hey, yeah, we just came out with this children's series. And I, you know, the the rep that I was talking to, she was the actual writer. And she was like, yeah, we and we use this thing called augmented reality so that we can uh, bring the stories to life. And so I was like, what? And so they showed it to me. And quite literally, that was exactly what I was trying to do uh, from what I saw with the Masters of the Sun and being able to incorporate that into incorporate animation directly into the book so that when I tell people I'm an animator, I can actually show them the animation right there on my phone or on my iPad by virtue of the book. And more importantly, they could buy my books and I can and I can incorporate the animation in it to where I'm able to sell them animation at a way that's scalable. And so for me as a business owner, when it adds value to the work that I do, and more importantly, it allows me to really lean into my passion of being an animator while also being a comic illustrator, because as a comic creator, all you're doing is just making storyboards for the animation. And so instead of having to compromise and say, oh, you know, I can't add this or I can't add this because it's really hard to illustrate. I can quite literally add those things and then incorporate animation in it the way that I want to and have it be in the context of a book instead of a screen. And it, and it just adds so much value to it.
So when she showed me that and she's like, oh, yeah, you know, we made our own app and all that stuff. I was like, whoa, that is exactly what I'm trying to do. And so I asked her, I was like, hey, could I have one of the books? She gave me one of the books. And then she was like, if you have any questions about anything, just let me know and we could help get you started on, you know, how to make your own and stuff. And so very much like how my mentors at Oregon State just sort of put me on game like they did, too. And I really appreciate them for that because they they didn't need to right? like they're a big company and all that stuff. But like I was really passionate and that came across and I left an impression and they were willing to help me. And so I remember getting home, writing them email. And I'm just like, how do you guys how did you guys get started with this? And they were just like, hey, you know, like this is the resources that we use. This was Unity, all that stuff. And so I quite literally um, in December during one of the Unity holiday sales, I quite literally just got me a intro to Unity course, intro to augmented reality course for like 10 bucks. And the rest was history. I think I watched those videos and did the projects like every day for like a month. And then I ended up like publishing the first app of um, or the first version of the app for Island Fever. And uh, and during that time, I started to really pick up speed as, a, as an animator. And so I started to uh, get more clients. I ended up working uh, with Westbrook Studios uh, by virtue of a couple of homies that, uh, that hooked me up with that. And uh, that was pre-COVID, really. And so I ended up like quitting my job uh, as a personal trainer and going down the road of being an independent animator, a freelancer. And I was going to be making more money than I ever thought that I would be making in a, in a small amount of time. It was really great. Um, but as COVID started to ramp up, one of the things that started to happen was all the plans that they had at the studio for making animated stuff, because they really enjoyed the things that I was creating and they really liked my style. Um, I started to see that they were starting to roll back a lot of that stuff because they were going to have to cancel it because of COVID. And so that put me in a really bad position because I didn't have a lot of money coming in, but I did have a drive to sort of create stuff. And so as more and more projects sort of got canceled, it really just gave me an opportunity to like lean into the augmented reality stuff and my own business stuff for better or for worse. And so uh, by the time COVID hit, all my projects were canceled. I wasn't really doing any st things with, uh, with Breastbrook anymore. And which kind of sucked because I was like, man, I'm a big Will Smith fan. And so, you know, being able to create more stuff uh, under his uh, studio would have been so nice, but it just didn't really work out that well. And during that time, I really just started to create AR stuff. And I, at, the, at that point, I was just creating stuff and trying to see whatever stuff I could augment. And then I'll just post it on Twitter. I'll post it on the internet and just have just like a rolling diary of like, you know, I need to get out of this situation. And so the best way to get out of the situation is quite literally just work my way through it. And if I could work my way through it, then things will work out. In the background, right? Like I'm still a pre-med student. I'm still trying to get into medical school. Around the time that COVID started to hit, I ended up going on two interviews, medical interviews, um, to Reno and OHSU. And at the end of it, I ended up getting rejected. And I sort of went through this whole rigmarole of getting rejected by 70, over 70 medical schools, getting rejected after thinking that I was going to get in after I got the interviews. And, you know, I, and I didn't have a job. I didn't have any money. I didn't have anything. Right. It was just a rough time, but it was a rough time for everybody. Right. Like COVID 2020, it was rough. Uh, but through that, I, I really needed to work myself out of this very much like I worked myself back from being in a wheelchair to going back to playing football at a division one level and starting the first game in less than a year. This is one of those things that really spoke to my resilience. And so I was just like, every day, I'm just going to make it a point to learn Blender, to learn Unity, to learn more about AR. I had no interest in making games. And so I was just like, how do I find ways to make books and then convert those books into animated experiences, augmented experiences? I didn't have the, the lexicon at the time, but what I was trying to do was I was literally laying the framework for me as an immersive storyteller where I'm combining, you know, animation and art and illustration and sound and user interactions all into one experience that speaks to telling a story within books. Right. And, uh, 
and then I started to have this idea of like, how do I make the experiences better with the headset and all that stuff, right? And so that's all just sort of happening all at once. And I'm trying to make sense of it, trying to make sense of all the opportunities that are coming my way and lack of opportunities, right? But I really just for the first three, four months of COVID, I was just grinding, you know, grinding and trying to put stuff out there and express myself in a way that makes sense. And so from there, I ended up thinking about, okay, what if I apply to different grants and stuff that are popping up? I, I started doing that. That worked out in my favor. And then I also got a mentor um, at UNR uh, that also helped me or convinced me to apply during that the next cycle as well uh, for 2021. And so it was just all these things that just started to really fall into place that laid the foundations for me being where I am today. And, and one of those big things that really t- you know, tipped the scale for me was um, you know, having a meeting with uh, the director of admissions at UNR. And she flat out said, you know, like you, you should be in medical school and you should apply and you know, we will help you with the, with the resources that we can to make sure that you have the best application moving forward because you're somebody that we feel will be an asset to medicine. And uh, to be honest with you, like I was at a point now where um, I was two cycles in, I didn't get in after my second cycle, took the MCAT twice. I think I was like 7,000 or $8,000 in the hole. I was like two, three years out, uh, out of my post back. And I was in my thirties. Right. Like, and so I just, you know, in my mind, I was like, I need to, you know, I, I, I don't know if I could apply this cycle. I'm going to try to get a job, get more experience, whatever. And she was like, no, nah, like, just do another cycle. We'll help you fill in your gaps and everything. And, and you know, we want to we want to see you there. And I think I ended up getting one of the uh, first grants for the Black Realities Grant, which is a grant for black creators that's founded, that's funded and founded by uh, Viola Davis. And then I ended up uh, getting invited to the Unity for Humanity Summit. And uh, by virtue of that, I, you know, did a panel. Uh, and that panel, uh, what I did on that panel, what I said on that panel, uh, caught wind by the, uh, you know, a speaker committee at the Wall Street Journal uh, Future of Everything Festival. And quite literally, I ended up uh, getting an email from Unity asking if I wanted to uh, get featured in the Wall Street Journal and had just about this project that I was doing on the side. And I was just like, what? Like, just something I said on a panel just translated to me getting a Wall Street Journal feature uh, off of like a project that I was tweeting about uh, that I was doing in Portland. And I just like, you know, one thing led to another, led to another. Um, you know, one of the deans of Portland Community College ended up reaching out to me and asking me if I wanted to teach because they saw my panel at the Unity for Humanities. And then, you know, I ended up uh, getting an interview from uh, Reno and also University of uh, Chicago uh, the next cycle. And after that, I ended up getting into medical school. Um, And so by the time I actually got featured in the Wall Street Journal, I was already accepted into medical school. And really the only things that I was doing at that point was teaching, I was creating, I was making courses, and I was doing all those things that I really enjoyed and putting it all in one package. And so I I would often joke to people where they would say, oh yeah, you know, I'm not like doing what I uh, went to school to do. And for me, that was far from the truth. I was doing exactly what I went to school to do. Uh, and I was doing it in a way that uh, that spoke to the experiences that I had. It spoke to the skills that I had, and it spoke to the interests that I had with wanting to put stuff out there and inspire people. And I always joke around because, you know, like one of the things that happened back when I was couch surfing in L.A., my cousin, he was a very, very good football player. He played for the Denver Broncos and had this agency that he was working with. And he was like the top person at their agency, right? Um, you know, when you're Peyton Manning's 
you know, main tight end, you you get you get you you have some accomplishments, right? And so uh, by virtue of that, I just wanted to get a job to where I could pay bills and I could just make buttons and stuff, and uh, just use the software to pay bills and utilize my skills. And it was one of those situations where I really thought that I had a good resume and a good body of work to go into the creative space when I finished playing football. But that was far from the truth, especially after doing a documentary and all that stuff and and being able to create at the level that I was creating. I thought I could at least get hired at any sort of creative agency or get an internship or anything like that. And that was just not what happened. And it was really frustrating because I remember talking to the creative director of the agency that my cousin was with. And I was just like, hey, you know, I just need a job, right? Like just a job, just something to get a stable income so I could eventually stop sleeping on my sister's couch. And, you know, I ended up having a meeting with him. And the first thing he said was, one, we don't have a job. We, you know, we're not going to hire you. Um, And then two, he was like, we see that you have a whole bunch of stuff that like you're interested in. And it's really hard for us to understand what you want to do. And at this point, I was just like, dude, I was hungry. I was just like, dude, I need a job. Like, I'll do anything. Like, anything, if you want me to make, you know, buttons in Illustrator and all that stuff, I'll do that. You know, I don't care because I just want to get my feet. uh, I just want to just get things going first. And then it's a luxury to think about, you know, what I like to do because I just need to do something. Uh, And ultimately, like, he was just like, well, there's nothing we can do for you. But one of the things that we would suggest is that you take all the stuff that you're interested in, try to create a brand or create something that allows you to incorporate all your skills into one project so that when people see the project, they have an idea of what they can hire you for. And so for me, it was like, okay, it's not about me having the skills to do something, but I have to have, I have to show a direction there that I can be useful to people. And because I'm doing websites and I'm doing animation and I'm doing illustration and comics and VFX and album covers and all that, I guess it's too much for people to understand. Uh, and, and that, at least from like a creative agency perspective, uh, and that was really frustrating. But with that, I think it, you know, it, it fueled me to just be like, okay, well, I'll show you like, I'll show you that I could get hired. And if it's not for me, I'll be in a better position than working for you Uh, and so I sort of had that sort of chip on my shoulder but it also forced me to narrow and like consolidate all the things into one project Uh, and so anything that I did would be incorporated into that one project with an asterisk right because we're talking about me here the person that does the animation the illustration and the and the VFX and the audio right and so I ended up uh, coming up with an extension of my uh, blog called Stuck on an Island, and I ended up uh, creating an extension called Island or Iltopia. And one of the reasons why I came up with Iltopia was because I wanted to give the island that I had a name, and I wanted to reference sort of this uh, dichotomy of like being in Hawaii, thinking about that as sort of being paradise, but after a while, you realize that that paradise is. You know, it's not paradise, right? Like it's a play on ill, where ill is sickness, and it's also like pretty sick, which is like cool. And then like the utopia, the ideal place to be, to like exist and create. And so I created this um, project called Iltopia so that I could get hired. Quite literally, is just a portfolio piece. So I could get hired. And so when I started to create under the banner and I started to make comics and I started to make stickers and I started to explore character design and storytelling and product design for better or for worse under the brand of Iltopia that was just a mock brand so that I could use that to get hired for projects and get hired as a creative agency the crazy thing about it was that yeah I got a couple of projects here and there but like I never actually got hired by virtue of that portfolio piece, I ended up having that become the business that I operate now. And so Iltopia Studios quite literally started off as a portfolio piece so that I could get hired at Creative Studios 
and now it is you know a pro a publishing company that you know explores the intersections of uh, traditional published print publishing and emerging technology by virtue of AR and animation and immersive storytelling and it just it's one of those things that I just sort of joke around about where I'm just like this didn't serve the purpose that I anticipated that it would have but it really gave me a home uh, by virtue of it being you know a utopia for me uh, it gave me a home for all my creative uh, exploits and once AR was introduced once I started to expand with comics and education and entertainment and really started to build the brand up I realized that like I don't need to work for anybody I just need to invest the time that I need to spend to build out and carve my own niche and you know it is there's it comes with a lot of battle scars to be honest with you it's not as fun of an experience as I would hope but at the end of the day I've never felt more freer and so fast track right like fast track uh, I, I get into medical school fresh off of the Wall Street Journal feature um, I'm teaching at Portland Community College and I'm doing all these things and money I'm still in medical school right and uh, you know I'm speaking at the game developer conference I'm speaking at you know augmented world expo I'm making sales still trying to figure out this whole thing and I end up applying to the integrative neuroscience program at UNR because they have an augmented reality and virtual reality track for their uh, integrative neuroscience program. And so out of all the places to go to medical school, OHSU was my top choice and I really wanted to stay in Portland, uh, but just they, they didn't want me, right? Like, and that's just something that I, I came to terms with over time, but being at Reno by far was the best decision that I ever made, mainly because all of the research, medical research, tech research, as it relates to medicine, all comes through Reno uh, because they're the only institution that supports an MD, PhD. And they have one of the largest tech budgets of any state because of how under-resourced they are with people. And so I always thought it was funny that, you know, if you can't afford people, you just throw money at technology because technology can uh, really mitigate some of those factors. And so me being a medical student with this experience in software development, and animation, and all these different things, AR, and by virtue of COVID, uh, I, get into the, I ended up getting into the integrative neuroscience program. And now I'm able to quite literally explore the intersections of immersive storytelling and medicine and how it can incorporate a whole bunch of variety of sense, human senses so that make educational experiences, edu entertainment experiences, more immersive and have people have deeper connections to them by the amount of sensory inputs that I could add to an experience. It is like, you know, just off the rip, right? Like, you know, in medical school, I'm a neuroscientist now. I'm exploring all these different things that I used to do on the side and now I'm doing all those things together and I'm getting support for it. And so, you know, my journey in and of itself has been really, really interesting because I never thought that I would get to a point where I can enjoy myself, enjoy the intersections of art and medicine and entertainment and tech and education and be able to invite people to the world that I'm in. And so as of today, I am the first black MD PhD student in the history of the state of Nevada, and I'm getting a PhD in integrative neuroscience. And one of the things that comes with that is the opportunity to incorporate uh, animation and uh, entertainment practices and emerging technology into the field of medicine so that I can lower the barriers of entry for people to get a baseline level of health education and improve their health literacy and eventually approach medical education from this, from this lens. But more importantly, create cool stuff that empowers people to do their own research and uh, learn for themselves in a way that's culturally relevant outside of just listening to Joe Rogan ramble on about stuff that actually doesn't make any sense within health and medicine. And ultimately empowering people so that they don't fall victim to 
scams and, and capitalism and all these things that really hurt people. And so I really hope that I can continue to do that. You know, I, I'm, I'm really enjoying this experience right now. And, and the best part about this is it allows me to really express myself in a way that makes sense. And so, like always, um, you know, subscribe, check me out on all the social nets, at Iltopia, at Stuck on an Island. And, you know, I hope, you know, I hope to be able to create more stuff and share with more with you guys. So, without that, I will catch y'all later.